Welcome to day four of Truth and Reconciliation Week. My name is Sonia Moselle from RBC Royal Bank in Edmonton, Alberta. I am delighted to introduce to you Carrie Newman. Carrie is a Kowaljala and Coast Salas artist, master carver, filmmaker, author, former opera singer, and speaker about the spirit of reconciliation. We are pleased to welcome you to this session of Hands On, Hearts On. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you very much, Sonia. I'm happy to be here this morning. Um, and uh, good morning or good early afternoon to everybody out there, depending on where you're coming from. Um, as Sonia said, my name is Carrie Newman. My traditional name is High Elf Kingame, and I come from the Kokwekum, Gixam, and Wawalabai Namima of the Kokwakiwak Nation on the northern end of Vancouver Island. That's through my grandfather on my father's side. I come from the from Chiam of the Stalo Nation along the Upper Fraser Valley through my grandmother on my father's side. Uh, and my on my mother's side, my ancestry is of English, Irish, and Scottish settler stock. Um, I'm excited to be here to present to you all this morning and to share with you a little bit about a project I did called the Oakland's Totem. And I'm going to start my screen share so that you can see what I'm talking about. There we go. So <clears throat> the Oakland's totem, which I came to start, I came to call um, Hands On, Hearts On, was a project that I did at my daughter's school, Oakland's Elementary, over the past couple of years. Um, it was the idea of my wife, Elaine, who is also, a, who is a teacher. And the first time that she saw me carve a pole from the beginning, uh, where it was just a drawing on a piece of paper, to the end, where it was painted and standing, she thought it would be a great way, uh, a great thing to have as part of a school. And the way that she imagined it wasn't for everybody to just watch while I carved a pole but for everybody to participate in some way and so that's what the Oakland totem is it's a, a pole that I carved with um, with my assistant Teus but also with the help of all the students from kindergarten to grade five at Oakland's elementary. Um, we also got help from teachers and from the principals and from other community members. Um, right from the very beginning, um, when, I, when I went to speak to the principal, uh, Mr. Hovis, uh, about whether or not he would want to do something like this, he embraced the idea. He thought that it would be great. And what he told me about why he thought it would be a good thing to do is that he, he always felt like we were celebrating things, um, but not learning deeply about them. Um, and so he was a big supporter and his, uh, it, the, the one thing that the school had been doing before that was Orange Shirt Day. Um, and so this, that is what the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation has been called up until today. This is the first time that we're having a National Day of Truth and Reconciliation in this country. So I asked David if we could do this project and he agreed and we, we set about looking for um, some support to make it happen. Um, but the first thing that I did was we got the children involved from the very beginning. So that meant that they got to help choose the animals that went onto this poll. Um, totems have, have different meanings in my culture. Sometimes they're raised to celebrate um, something that happened in a community. Sometimes they're raised to commemorate something. 
sometimes they're raised to memorialize, to remember. Um, and sometimes they're kind of like a family portrait. They tell the story of a particular family. And that's the kind of totem that I decided we would make for the Oakland's totem, that we would make a family totem for the community of Oakland's. Um, we gave the teachers um, descriptions of all the different animals and what they meant. And the teachers then brought that into their classrooms and started to talk to the kids about what they each meant. And then we held a vote where, um, where the kids participated in, uh, in choosing the animals. Um, <clears throat> this particular image here is at the very, very beginning when we went to find the log. Um, so we went, even, even when it came to picking the tree that we were gonna carve, um, we were involving different members of the school. Um, the vote that was held um, came out to be that the otter was the absolute favorite of all of the students. Um, the wolf cub was another favorite and it made it onto the pole. The bear uh, was the other one. And those were the three animals that were chosen by the vote. Uh, because I really, really like the raven because the raven um, is the transformer. And I, I also got to choose one animal. We just, I decided to put the raven on. But when we were counting the votes and um, sharing the results with the, with the students, there was some kids who were pretty upset that their choices didn't make it on. So I decided then that I would include in some small way all of the animals that had gotten a vote. Um, and I like to think about that as um, proportional representation. So once we had the animals selected, we, and, and the log brought in, we started to work on, on making the poll. And what the, the way that we were involving everyone was we were, kids got to actually help out, but part of helping out meant getting them to bring out to the totem, which was being carved in the schoolyard, the things that they were learning about in their classrooms. So they would tell me about the different math concepts that they were learning or the different biology concepts that they were learning or governance. And I would talk with them about how a, how I might use math in carving a pole or what role a totem has in governance in my community. Um, and so we had this really fun way of involving everyone so that the project wasn't just something to observe, it was something to participate in. And at the very beginning, well, the first time that I got the students to come out, you could see that they were a little bit nervous and shy about participating. But as I, uh, as we went through the sessions and we started to get them to, to try different things, to use different tools, you could see how they were slowly beginning to take ownership of it. And rather than shuffling their feet and looking down, when, I would, when they would come out, they would be filled with questions. And they would be asking if they, when, when was their turn and could they have another turn? Um, and so that was, that was how we were going on. And, and we, we, the only tool I didn't let any of the kids use, by the way, was the chainsaw. And that was the one tool that probably had the most requests if somebody, if the kids could try it. But um we didn't, I didn't let them use any of the power tools, but you can see here, um, they were using chisels, adzes, knives. Um, they helped with tracing the design onto the pole. Um, they helped with, with carving it. Um, and if everything was going on along really well, and this is the, the hands-on part of the hearts on hands-on. The project also led to other things because we knew that eventually we were going to finish this poll and raise it. Um, 
so the school community decided that they wanted to make drums and they had a drum making workshop and that's what we're looking at here where um where teachers and students and parents came together to to make drums and the reason they wanted to do that was so that they could sing um and drum while the pole was being unveiled when i was working on the poll, I was trying to think of a way that I could show to somebody who is seeing the installation for the first time that it was a poll made by many hands, made with the help of all of the students. And so we started gathering handprints from all of the kids. And we would get, we would roll blue paint onto their hand and then place it onto the paper. Um, and we would write their name and their division as so we kept them all together in classes. Um, and I'll show you how we use these handprints in a little bit here. It was, everything was going really, really well um, for a hearts on hands on project until, uh, until a pandemic came. Um, and as, as everybody here uh, knows it really changed things and it changed this project too because um, we could no longer do the hands-on part um, of the Oakland's totem for a while so we had to think of different ways to keep going um, different ways to accomplish what we'd started out to accomplish uh, but that delay meant that we instead of trying to rush and finish the poll which is which we were about a little over halfway complete when the pandemic came, um, we decided to stretch it out for another year. So, so that people could participate. And, and we were hoping that by the time we were finished, we would be able to, to come together as a large group and raise the poll. I think this might be a familiar kind of site for, for some people who remember when the playgrounds were closed and we were all trying to figure out what, what was okay to do. Um, so rather than having everybody come and carve, we set up Zoom like we're doing right now. And I had a, a camera above the pole and I had my headphones on and we had a, another camera that I, that I held um, to, sh to give people a closer view of things and we carried on with the work um, with the kids uh, with the classes coming in via zoom um, and it was pretty neat because not only would we have students um, who maybe hadn't seen each other for a little while but we also got to meet a lot of the parents that we we might not normally get to see um, and so even though we weren't able to continue coming together in the same way the community grew a little bit more. Um, one of the things that I, I mentioned a little while ago was that this poll was uh, to tell the story of the family of Oakland. Um, and so the reason that they chose the animals were for particular characteristics that they identified with. The playfulness of the otter, the uh, the faithfulness and the teaching ability of the wolf and the gentle strength and dreams of the bear. Um, <clears throat> but when the pandemic came and everything changed, I realized that we were gonna have to add an animal. We were gonna have to find a way to tell that, that part of the story. And that's when I thought of this book that I had read when I was little, and it's called The Little Hummingbird. And the story is about there a time when there was a great forest fire and all of the animals were running away from the fire, except for one, the little hummingbird. The little hummingbird was going to the lake and to the fire and back and forth to the lake and to the fire, dropping little droplets of water. And when the other animals said, little hummingbird, what are you doing? <clears throat> the hummingbird responded, I'm doing what I can. And I thought about 
what that means in the middle of a pandemic when we had to wear masks or we had to wash our hands a lot or we didn't get to see our friends or grandparents or our schools weren't open and those we started to relate all of those things to the drops of water the, from the hummingbird that they were the things that we can do the little things that we can do to help each other and so i started to carve a hummingbird to add to the total um and and this is this is it here um as we were coming towards the completion of the totem which um we raised earlier this year in May. We had lots of different action going on. We had diggers coming in to, to clear out the, the dirt, to pour the foundation. We had students coming to help paint um, and carve because things had opened up again and we could, we, could, we could work together. And eventually the day came when it was time to raise the pole. <clears throat> we had um, we invited uh, a local knowledge keeper um, to to guide us through the ceremony. Uh, we invited elders to do a blessing. Um, this is this particular person here is named Bradley Dick, and he's a an incredible um, Lekwungen person, and he led us through the ceremony of unveiling. Um, one of the things that we had to do was unveil rather than raise because we couldn't have enough people there to be able to pull a totem up. Um, so we had a machine put it in place and we had people help to unveil it because we needed to keep the group to a particular size. So here's the students um, coming together to, to unveil the pole and you can start to see what it ended up looking like. And as we go forward, I'll show you, I'll point out where the different animals on it are. And <clears throat> as the kids were unveiling it, another group of kids were singing um, and drumming. And it was an incredible, incredibly beautiful moment, even though it was a little bit overcast and rainy that morning. It was so neat to see um, my culture being practiced in this way, being part of a school and a whole community in this way. And here is uh, the completed Oakland's totem with hands on and on the other side of that panel, it says hearts on. And then here's the bear with the frog there and the salmon in the leg. Remember I said I would try to find a way to fit all of the the animals that didn't get the most votes on salmon was one of them frog was one the eagle there in the arm of the bear there's a, an orca in the leg of the whale there's a moon on the chest and that little bead in the beak of the raven is the sun um, <clears throat> and during the ceremony i placed the hummingbird right there and that's where it sits now um, you can see the hand wall and you remember seeing the, the blue handprints of all of the students. We, I took the handprints and I cut them in, into this rubber resist and sandblasted them to push the handprint in to the, to the wooden panels. And so all of the students who helped out on this project are represented by either a handprint or a heart. And they got to pick the color of paint that they wanted their handprint to be. And if they were available, they were able to come and paint their own handprint. And it was pretty neat when we did the unveil because the first thing that students started to do was to come forward and, and look for the place where their handprint was and see if it still fit. And one of the things that I thought about while that was happening was, What's this going to look like when they're grown up? When they come back and their teacher or their 
the leaders of um, a, of a decade from now, um, maybe two decades from now. And what difference will that make in the way that they think about reconciliation? What difference will that make in the way they think about the relationship between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people? What difference will that make in the way that they think about our responsibility to land? Because one of the things that I think about quite a bit when I think about reconciliation is, is that. How are we taking care of the land that takes care of us? When the project was over, um, I got a book filled with, with little notes of thank you from the students. And this, these are a few of them. Uh, and any time that I need something to pick me up a little bit, I, I think about this. Um, I go and look at this book because I think that students of today are the greatest hope for reconciliation that we have in this country because all of you are growing up with a different understanding about Indigenous people with a different understanding about the history of Canada. And I think that that will result in positive change for the future. So I'm gonna stop my share now and I just want to try and see if I can share one more little piece because I have some video I think what I really learned was that a totem is more than just a statue, it's a story, because each of those animals represents this story. I like to like it how we got to pick out what animals that we, were, we got to put on it. I like the hummingbird because it showed us all, we all have to just do little by little to help fight off this pandemic. My favorite animal is the wolf because it always stays in its pack and it's always a team player, always helps each other out. My favorite thing about the Oakland Totem Project was I really liked painting the handprints and just carving the pole. It just started out as like a, a tree and then it turned into this beautiful piece of art. Every like morning I walk into Oakland and I see it and kind of represents our school because we got to put our handprints on it. It allows us to see culture that's around us all the time and not just pulled out of a textbook. It's about learning about who you're standing side by side with. When I first saw the totem and all the handprints, I felt really special because I got to have my handprint painted on. I thought it was really cool that I would be able to like, show all my grandparents and my friends that I had my hand on it. It makes us feel as a whole, everybody that looks at the totem, knows that they are a part of that, they're a part of our community, that we all belong together. It's like my own part of it, like I'm a part of it, so it feels really special to me. My favorite thing about the Oakland Totem Project was unveiling because I was one of the unveilers. And for me, it was really cool because I've been here from when they started the totem, and they've gone so far along the way. I thought it was just amazing to have a totem that we helped and it's here on the ground and we're part of history, I guess. It made me feel happy and excited because I've never been to a school with a totem pole, much less seen it actually being unveiled. I think that's what this totem project has done is it's touched every single person that's worked on it. I have First Nations heritage and it was incredible. It was a moment I will savor for the rest of my life and pass on to my grandchildren and my children. So that is the story of the Oakland's totem. And I thank you for joining me today and I'm gonna pass it back to Sonia to help with questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Carrie, for that wonderful presentation. Just gonna to look to see if there are any questions for Carrie this morning or this afternoon. Uh, 
And there are no questions at this time. Well. <clears throat> Carrie, can I just ask you a question uh, while we're waiting perhaps for some questions to come in? Sure. Uh, first of all, I, I admire this whole project and what it meant to all of the people that were involved. What was the one thing that you did take away from this incredible experience? I think that the the thing maybe that I took away the most was was what I touched on there about the hope that working with students brings. Um, the day we raised the poll was actually May 27th. And May 27th was the day that um, the Kamloops First Nation first announced the confirmation of the unmarked graves that were uncovered there. And so I, on that day, I was kind of stuck between the hope and inspiration of the morning um, and the weight of those of that announcement in the afternoon. Um, and it, it really, I think, sunk in for me um, the importance of finding ways to connect with, with students. Because um, from my father, my father's generation, he was a resident, he is a residential school survivor, to my generation, where I grew up not, not learning about Indigenous culture in school, to my daughter's generation, um, you can see that the ch that there is change coming. The change is happening all around us. Um, and when you think about a word like reconciliation, and it seems so big and so difficult to uh, to to know how to do it, I think maybe some of the advice comes from the hummingbird. You just do the little bits that you can. Um, and so I, I think that's what I take away from that experience of, of working on that poll with all of those students. Wonderful, thank you. We do have some questions coming in. Um, so one of the questions that is coming in is how long did the process take? The, the project ran for a little over two years. Originally, it was planned for a little over one, but when the pandemic disrupted um, things, rather than raising it in May of uh, 2019, or sorry, two, rather than raising it in May of 2020, we raised it in May of 2021. Um, and it was something that we did on a weekly basis. Every Friday was the day that we went and worked on the poll at Oakland's. <clears throat> so that means that it would, we'd be able to finish it quite a bit faster um, if we worked on it every day. But um, we just fit it into uh, the, the workings of the school, the curriculum of the school. And we went at, um, at a pace that made sense so that, so that, all the students could participate in some way. Wonderful. That, that question came in from Nancy Knight. Thank you, Nancy. There's another question here from uh, Tressa Teru Bruvier, uh, grade seven, grade eight class. They did have two questions. One was just answered moments ago, so thank you. What kind of wood is the pole made from? It is made from a Western red cedar. And the reason that I make a totem from red cedar is because it has a lot of natural oils that protect it from rotting. Mm -hmm. And so a long time ago, and it also has big long stretches and sections of, of a tree trunk that have no branches. Um, knots on a totem are really hard to carve. So I always look for a piece of wood that has as few knots as possible. Um, a long time ago, when my ancestors carved poles, we would carve and le we would leave a big part of the pole that was uncarved to to go into the ground and we would would bury the bottom part so you needed a wood that would be able to survive a long time um, without rotting um, so that's those are some of the reasons that um, I choose that, that we chose to carve from cedar 
Great, thank you. Another question coming in from Nancy, who did you learn your totem pole artistry from? Um, I had the good fortune or the privilege of growing up in a household with a master carver, my dad. Um, so I sat by his knee when he was making all kinds of carvings when I was little. Um, and I remember, I probably can't, can't show it over the camera, but I remember when I was five years old, it was the first time that I carved and I cut my thumb. Um, and it, it gave me a really healthy respect for, for the tools. Um, and just in case anybody was wondering what I was carving when I was five, I carved a wooden car that I still have somewhere in this house. I used, um, pieces of leftover pieces from my dad's wood shop and spools of thread um, from inside the house that became the wheels. That's wonderful. And you still have that car to this day. I do. I should dig it out because it, it, may, it might be the earliest uh, art project that I have. <laughs> Wonderful. We have another question coming in from Chessa Tarubuvier. How many students were involved in this project? Oakland's is a pretty big school. I think it has a little over 500 students. And because it took place over the course of two years, we had um, a second cohort of kindergartners come in. So I think that we had um, student-wise, just shy of 600, um, and all in total with the, the staff and the teachers and the principals, um, a little over 600. So I, I think maybe we have 620 handprints or something like that on that wall. That's absolutely wonderful. We've got another question coming in from Mimi. What is the tallest totem that you have made? Oh, that's a great question. The tallest totem I have made is 36 feet. Um, and I have a, an interesting story about that totem because I finished it two and a half years ago. And later in uh, next month, I'm going to go to Germany to see it raised. It's finally going to be raised. But while I was carving that pole, I came to the realization that because we don't have very many old growth cedars left that I was going to need to change the way that I make my poles and so that pole is the largest that I've carved and it's also the last one that I'm going to do using old growth cedar for for any other purpose than um, cultural purpose so it was a, a really neat experience to carve one that was so big because the pole in at Oakland's is 12 feet so the one that I carved was three times bigger than the one in Oakland's and if you've ever thought oh I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to finish this project that I'm working on or finish the studying that I'm doing just think about finishing it one little bit at a time because when you're working on a totem that big, if you look at the whole thing, then it never feels like you've accomplished anything at the end of the day. But if you just look at the small space in front of you and you work on that, then you make progress slowly because that pull took over two years to make. And that was working almost every day. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, looking for any more questions for Carrie? So we do have another question from Nancy Knight. Anson is wondering how many totems you've made. Oh, that's a great question. I, I counted a couple of years ago and I had made 24 and I've now finished the Oakland's totem, which makes 25. And I'm almost finished another one um, that will be number 26. So, so far in my life, I've carved 26 totems and I have 
three more that I have to do in the next little while. You're going to be very busy. It does keep me very busy, yes. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Carrie? We have one more here from Tressley Touré Bouvier. Do you have a favorite project that you have worked on? Well, it'd be pretty easy for me to say that this is my favorite project um, because it was so much fun working with students. But there's another project that I did that I'm very, very proud of. And it's the project that is probably the reason that I'm speaking to everybody here today. And it's called The Witness Blanket. Mm -hmm. The Witness Blanket is... Uh, a work of art that I made from gathering objects, um, photographs, uh, documents from residential schools, churches, government buildings all across Canada. Um, and the blanket is now at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg. And the size of it, it's 40 feet wide and 10 and a half feet tall um, and it has over 800 objects that we gathered during the process it also we also made a documentary about it um, to to tell the story um, and it's it's a project that i learned a lot about this country about residential school history about my own father and about myself um, in the process of doing. And it's another one of those ones that took a long time. Um, I completed it in 2014. Um, and I started trying to think of an idea of what I could make in 2011. So there was about a three year creative process to make the witness blanket. Wonderful, thank you. And Nancy Knight has a question. How old were you when you made your first totem from Molly? Oh, I think I would have been 1990. I think I would have been 19 years old when I carved my first totem. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm 46 now. So I've carved those totems in, in that, that span. Great, thank you. We have another question here uh, from Trusty Toron Bouvier, very familiar with the witness blanket. Uh, in my Indigenous studies classes every year, we spend time learning all about the witness blanket. How did your woodwork differ with that project versus the totem pole carving? That's an excellent question. It's quite different. Making the witness blanket was more like making furniture for a home where you use um, table saws and planers and power sanders and you're making working to make all of the surfaces flat and and uniform with with um, sharp edges. Um, it was like it was kind of like making a puzzle um, out of wood. A really really big puzzle and so I, I i have a i had to to set up a really wonderful woodworking workshop um that i can now use sometimes when i'm carving but the biggest difference is on a pole all the surfaces are curved and so you we use all different hand tools power tools too but hand tools to finish um, and on, uh, on the witness blanket, all of the wooden surfaces are flat. And so you use um, things like planers and sanders to, to make them that way. Wonderful, thank you. So we had a question regarding your favorite project. We have another question coming from Trusley Toubier, uh, pardon me, Turon Bouvier. One of the students would like to know what is the biggest project that you have worked on? biggest project mm -hmm. I think the biggest in both time and um, scale and the number of people who helped me work on it was the witness blanket um, the the size is 40 feet long by 10 and a half feet tall and so it's longer than the big pole that I worked on the number of people who helped on it was 
we probably had between 20 and 30 people helping to finish the witness blanket near the end, but there was hundreds and hundreds of people across Canada who helped make it by, by giving things, by giving objects to it. Um, and it's also probably the biggest project as far as the impact that it's had, because it got to go on tour for four and a half years. Um, and it is now in a, in a national museum that, um, that talks about human rights, which I think is um, a pretty important thing for a piece of artwork to, to do. And, and it's, it's leading to different kinds of change. Um, when the witness blanket was placed into the museum, we made a very special kind of agreement where rather than selling them the, the blanket, they became stewards along with me and along with witnesses. Um, and we agreed that all of the rights um, were with the blanket and all of the responsibilities were with me and with the museum. And so it's a different kind of, of legal contract legal agreement um, that that borrows ideas from Western law and from Indigenous law and puts them together into, into one, one way of, of taking care for a blanket, for a piece of artwork. Wonderful. Thank you so much to everyone for all the great questions. Carrie, thank you so much for this wonderful, inspiring story. And thank you for coming to this session. We hope you enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.